Welcome to Life Changing Challengers, the podcast where passion meets purpose. I'm Brad Minus, your host, guiding you through stories of transformation and triumph from endurance feats to overcoming adversity. Our guests defy the limits and inspire action. Ready to ignite your desire and incinerate your barriers? Join us. Your journey to the extraordinary begins now. And welcome back to another episode of Life Changing Challengers. Again, I'm your host, Brad Minus, as always. And I have to tell you something. I am so honored and so humbled to have Fitz Kohler on the podcast today. And you have no idea how much of like a fanboy I am now. She's a fitness innovator, she's a race announcer, she's a speaker. And she's an author. She has books that she calls the Cancer Comeback Series, My Noisy Can- Cancer Comeback, Running at the Mouth While Running for My Life, Your Healthy Cancer Comeback, Six to Strong, Healthy Comeback Journal. And not only is she right in our wheelhouse as an, endur- as an endurance person, but she's also been on Dancing with the Stars. So we got to get into that. So Fitz, how are you today? Well, I am freaking delighted, Brad. Thank you so much for having me on your show. You are so sweet. And you're a fellow Floridian. How awesome is that? Fellow, I'm a f- fellow Floridian. Where are you? Gainesville. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I was born and raised in Fort Lauderdale, came up here for college and never left. But yeah, it's always nice to hang with a sunshine stater. Yeah, unfortunately, I grew up in Chicago. But I am now a Floridian. You're a so smart man. Take it. Yeah. 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 Um, By choice. Oh, yeah. That's all the credit. I am not going through those winners again. Believe you me. But anyway, so as I ask every one of my guests, can you tell us a little bit about your childhood, where you grew up? Well, I guess you already told us that. And the compliment of your family and what the environment was like. Yeah, so born and raised in Fort Lauderdale, moved into the house I grew up in. My mom's still there when I was three. I was the youngest of three. My brother was nine years older. Super cool guy, super handsome, athletic. My sister, six years older, very beautiful, very athletic, mean to me or very mean to me. So I was the youngest one dealing with a lot of stuff. I would say generically, we were middle class. We always had food on the table and we went to Disney for vacations. We weren't off in Europe. And yeah, it was very reasonable upbringing. Both of my parents work and we were scrappy. It was at a time where people weren't recording everything on their cell phones. So we got into a decent amount of trouble, never too much. I had a lot of my friends did drugs and slept with everybody. I drank all the beer and kissed all the boys, but never went too far beyond that. I I drank lots of beer. Boy, did I ever. Yeah, we had fake IDs. We were little troublemakers, but also with this really wholesome sidebar where my mom said never egg a house or a car because you could that could be very expensive paint replacing those things with paint so I would never egg a house so any anything we did was just harmful or stupid for ourselves but yeah fun beachgoer Uh, my very first car was a Suzuki Samurai the little baby Jeep and then my next car was a Jeep Wrangler two-door And my present car is a Jeep Wrangler four door and all stick shift and just rowdy and scrappy and public high school, massive public high school. We had all the friends of all the colors, all the religions. Fort Lauderdale is that kind of place. And yeah, I uh, some really nice memories in my family and some not so nice. My dad was a prescription pill popper, which wasn't awesome. And so. Uh, I might be giving you more than you asked for, but you know, we were we were gritty and we got through it. And I, I got to college and created my own destiny. And yeah, things are really good. Really good. So did you so you're an endurance athlete now? Were you an endurance athlete back in high school? What's interesting is we were very sporty and I, my siblings were elite athletes. I played everything, but I was never really good at anything. So I I think I started off with t-ball and flag football cheerleading and then I joined the soccer team and I I rode the bench a lot playing soccer blew my knee out at 14 had a MCL ACL reconstruction was in crutches for six months that type of thing so that didn't enhance my athleticism so I didn't make our soccer team school soccer team because that was they were state champions (laughs) I happened to be at the school with the best soccer team which wasn't good for me 
I just wanted to be on a team. So I tried out for softball and wasn't very good. They cut me. I tried out for volleyball and my mom was worried about me landing on my knee. So she made the coach cut me. Tried out for cheerleading the first couple of years of high school, didn't make it. And then in senior year, year they chose me. And I made the team and they made me captain, which is cool. But yeah, not, I wasn't great at anything. But at about 15, that's when I started teaching fitness. I started teaching group exercise or aerobics classes at a local gym. And that really uh, changed my state. I became good at something where physical fitness was involved. And, and I loved it, not only the way it made me feel, but the connection I got to have with all the people that I was teaching fitness to. And that really set me off on my career. Wow. You, we were teaching fitness at 15. How does that happen? Usually people are just like, you're only allowed in the gym at 13. Okay, so this is great. So when I had my knee surgery when I was 14, I went to lots and lots of physical therapy. And before the PT released me, he told my mom, he said, you need to reg- you need to sign her up and get her going to a gym so she can continue strength training. She's going to re-injure this thing. So my mom lied. She lied and told the people at Spa Lady Fitness Center that I was 16. And so I was 14 going to the gym. And then I was working at Cinnabon. This is great. This is the the perfect vision. Just so you know, my first job was I was the birthday clown at the skating rink, which is not far off from what I do right now. I'm still the birthday clown. But yeah, I, I was working at Cinnabon, which is the opposite of fitness. But my manager was really mean. Her name was Ronnie and she was horrible. And so finally I quit Cinnabon at the mall. Thank goodness. And I applied at the gym because I really enjoyed being there. And I was taking classes. I thought the instructors were cool. And the manager who was interviewing me, he said, do you do our classes? I said, yeah. And he said, do you think you could teach one Friday night? This was a Tuesday or something. I said, sure. Thank God I'm a gamer. That's really that's the threat. That's how I became a fitness professional right at about 15 is because I said, yes. Can you do it? I said, "Ah, sure. And I'm of the mindset that if You get a good opportunity, agree to it, and then figure it out. And so I did. It all worked out. Oh, my God. So I I just have to ask this question because you're falling right in line. You ever heard of Laura Langmeier? I have not. Okay, so she's another personal development person. And she has this book called The Power of Yes. And it was a a little bit different story. So she gets out of college and... They ask her if she would start a fitness, a fitness gyms on oil rigs for the guys. Yeah. Knew nothing about fitness, knew nothing about gyms, but she just said yes. And that's like the same thing. Um, you were just like, hey, I was just taking the classes and now you're going in to teach one. So I was just, it almost was like a parallel. It was pretty cool. But uh, yeah, so you can see that I'm constantly talking about personal okay. role and stuff. But yeah, so that's amazing. So you were, so you're teaching So you got this job, you're teaching and you're going to school. And did you keep that up when you went to college? Yeah, I did. So I came up to the University of Florida, go Gators. And the first thing I did was apply at their fitness center. That's right. We do the big chomps. And I auditioned and they hired me right away. And I got on their schedule, which was great. And there was something special about teaching to a room full of 50 college students. I got to play the vulgar rap music that I maybe couldn't slash shouldn't play for some of the grownups. I was associating with at the other gym, but we got to be really rowdy at UF. And I taught all sorts of classes uh, to excess, but it was a wonderful part of my collegiate experience. And you get to make so many friends when you're the instructor, right? So 50 kids pour in and they instantly became your friend. They know your name, right? So I, I made a lot of great buddies through my fitness teaching. But in the summer after my sophomore year, I took a job on a cruise ship teaching fitness. I was a fitness director on the Crystal Harmony, which was a five-star cruise liner. And I boarded in New York. We sailed across to France, stopped in England, and then did every country in Scandinavia, plus Russia and Estonia a few times. And so that was pretty cool. That was my first time going global. And again, my family, we did Disney and Bush Gardens. We did not do Europe. So not only did I get to do it, but I got to go alone and I got paid for it. I just had so many wonderful experiences and it really gave me a lot of confidence and maturity being over there on my own, especially roaming the streets of Russia. And then when I came back to UF, there was a producer who was holding auditions for a fitness TV show called Cardio Jam. And I auditioned and he chose me. I was one of a handful of instructors. And so then I had 
a TV show that was airing three times a week. And that ex- expanded my my impact, which I that that's the thing that connected me with real strangers. I remember going to a <laughs> Sunny's barbecue, which is a, a barbecue joint and not the Mecca of healthy food. You can get salads or whatever. But anyways, I sit down and the morbidly obese waitress comes over to me and she's certainly not someone you would anticipate was exercising. Right. And she starts taking my order and she says, are you fit? And I said, I am. And she says, oh, my gosh, I love your show. You're my favorite instructor. I do it when it's on live. I record it and I have lost 17 pounds. And with that, she just it's almost like somebody punched me in my chest. I just I felt so, just was so meaningful to me. And so I love the fact that through mass media, I was able to help strangers. Were, would we be in the same social circle? She was a grown up. I was a college kid. What, could she have afforded me as a personal trainer? I tell you, I wasn't charging much back then, but I don't think her Sunny's Pit Barbecue waitress salaries would have connected us. And so because of that experience on TV, after her, people started coming out of the woodwork with similar experiences. And then I wrote my first article and that brought me in, connected me with people all across the country. And so I really, I'm so passionate about fitness. I'm a big believer that it can change your life. And and it's fact-based, right? I can stand on evidence that it will make your life better. It will help you live better and longer. And that's my mission. It's back at least 10 years of quality life onto everyone I come across. And so I haven't been, I haven't worked in a gym in decades because I learned really quickly that my power really was extended if I spent my time, my efforts on TV and radio, books, magazines, online content, per, uh, speaking engagements and so forth. And so I have the dream career doing what I love to do for people I truly care about. It's awesome. All right. So you got this TV show. You're impacting all these people, which I am so on board with. I try to do that myself and so excited about that. Oh, and by the way, remind me after we're done here to to tell you my sunny story because you're going to know that. Anyway, so we're going to go forward with that. But yeah, so you you made this impact. Where did running start for you? Or was that just always a part of your fitness? Yeah, so I was always running for exercise. I was a soccer player. Remember, I wasn't a very good one. (laughs) But we ran a lot. We ran a lot for all sports. When I was in high school, I was a bit overweight. And so I used uh, running as a way to try to manage my weight. And I think my, gosh, I believe there was a few fun runs or 5Ks involved in my life up to a point I really can't remember. But I think my first race I did was I was training a woman with breast cancer and her father hired me as a personal trainer for her and uh, she was doing great. And so we ran that making strides for breast cancer walk, uh, walk or run here in Gainesville. I ran with her and that was really my re-entry to racing and I've never been, well, never been. I, I was so proud. I was so proud. I ran the whole way with her and I just was just mesmerized by her ability to do what she was doing during treatment. And yeah, as we approached the finish line, I just backed off and let her go do it herself. And as magical. But yeah, jumped into racing excessively after that. I'm not sure how that happened, but here we are. All right. So there's the segue. You were training somebody with breast cancer. And for all of you, as you've known, I've already given you all of her titles. So obviously you had a scare and a, a part of this yourself that you ended up with breast cancer. Do you want to start with how, you, what were you feeling like when you start, when you started to feel like something was off and what that felt like and then how you ended up getting diagnosed? Yeah. So interestingly enough, I never, cancer never made me feel bad. I was healthy. I was actually at a race weekend getting ready to run a race when I found my lump. And I found that lump six weeks after a sparkling clean mammogram. So I had gone in at the end of December of 2018, had a mammogram there. They didn't miss anything that wasn't there. I'm assuming the second I stepped out into the parking lot, a cell went rogue. And so I'm at a race weekend and I get out of the shower and I rub my under boob. It's a Thursday. I rub my under boob just so I was itchy and I found a lump. Doctor describes it as a grape size lump. And I thought, ah, damn it. So 
standing there naked in the bathroom, and this is very important, I picked up the phone and I called my doctor. I did not Google it. I did not call my mom and cry or ask my friends what I should do. I just picked up the phone and call. And folks, if you have any sort of red flags, whether it's chest pain or a droopy face or a lump in your breast or testicle, you call right away. So I did. And I said, hey, I found a lump. And they said, hey, can you come in tomorrow? And I said, no, I'm running a race tomorrow. (laughs) And they said, okay, what about Monday? And I said, sure. So I kept it to myself. And I went in Monday and the doctor says, yeah, something suspicious. Let's get some scans. And so that was Monday, Thursday. I went in. Again, I hadn't told anybody. And I had a mammogram again. And then I went in for an ultrasound where the radiologist said, what? That mass is suspicious, but you also have several hard swollen lymph nodes we're concerned about. And I thought, that's when I thought for sure I'm dying because I knew I had cancer and it had spread. I know what the lymph nodes mean, right? So the very next morning I had a punch biopsy and a few days later I got a call from that surgeon that said, I am so sorry, Fitz Kohler, but that lump in your breast is indeed cancer. It's already spread to your lymph nodes. It is running through you like wildfire and we need to treat you immediately because it is it it's a big deal. We're treating you urgently and aggressively. And they did. And I ended up with 15 months of chemotherapy. I think I had 21 rounds. I had 33 rounds of radiation. I had several surgery. And I'm super grateful to say that I am several years cancer free. But I, I had the treatment triathlon and it was no fun. Yeah, I can't even imagine. First of all, I'd like to know who did your first mammogram because... No, they, they didn't miss it. And it's very interesting because we really? took that scan and they sent it to other radiologists who... Gainesville is a tight-knit community and uh, I'm pals with some doctors and people reached out and said, hey, I looked at your scan. She did not miss anything. It was not there. So, but again, it was this warp speed on fire. I'm going to kill you, Fitz Kohler type of booger. And I'm so grateful I found that lump because had I not found the actual lump, I wouldn't have known until perhaps I started coughing because it had settled into my lungs or perhaps I would have been confused because it had settled into my brain. And that's where breast cancer tends to go first is the lungs and the brain. And so I'm just very fortunate that I found that lump. I want to encourage everybody to squeeze their stuff every single week. Don't wait till you're 40. Don't wait till you're 35 or 50, whatever it is. Take your hands on your stuff and have a squeeze. Grope all the little special places in your body. And if you feel something, make that phone call, Make save your own darn life. And it's so much easier to cure something in stage one or two than three or four. And so, yeah, get all the scans and squeeze your stuff. So you found this a week after the the first mammogram where they said it was, six they weeks. said it was clear. Six oh, it's six weeks. weeks. Okay. Yeah. Six weeks. So with the way that you, the way that you said it was so aggressive, can I ask what did they dictate you at stage one or were you already at stage two? I was stage two B. Page two, which is okay. pretty quick for six weeks in. Oh, the second it spreads, it's really, there's so many different options based on each cancer case. It's like a snowflake. So the things that are relevant to me aren't really necessarily relevant mm-hmm. to everybody else. There's, uh, with breast cancer, they check three different things. One is, are you estrogen positive? Does your cancer feed off of estrogen? Does it feed off of progesterone? Progesterone, And is it H, uh, HER2 positive? And basically what HER2 means, as explained to me, is HER2 moves really fast. It's a rapid growing type of cancer. Mine was HER2 positive, estrogen positive, apparently on the border for progesterone. So I was told, hey, you got cancer. And then we were told, we're going to do further exams on your sample, on your biopsy, and then we'll let you know exactly what kind of breast cancer you had. And again, back then, I didn't even know there were multiple types of breast cancer. I thought breast cancer was breast cancer. And so I get a call from this oncologist, nurse practitioner or PA. She goes, hey, Fitz, I got your results and I want to let you know that you're, you tested positive for estrogen, progesterone, and HER2. And I let out the biggest F-bomb. I was meeting with my interns at a big old bakery. <laughs> I was like, freak, I'm going to say the, the ugly word. And I was like, I am definitely dying because now I'm positive for all of these things. And they said, no, in this case, the positives are good things because if you're positive for estrogen, they know how to kill that type of cancer. If you're HER2 positive, they have a solution for that. It's really the most tricky type of breast cancer is triple negative because they're really unsure what is what your tumors are feeding off of. So, so I, I was actually lucky that I was HER2 and estrogen positive, but 
I don't know. And once it spreads to your lymph nodes, usually you're in for chemo. And I can attest to chemo being not a good time. In fact, out of all of my treatments, chemo was by far the worst. It just brutalized me. I was wasted. I, of course, I lost my hair, all the hair, lost my fingernails. My stomach was a catastrophe. I lost tons of weight. I was beaten up by chemo. Radiation, I didn't find very difficult at the time. It was I didn't burn super badly like many people do. I have long lasting effects from radiation, which I hadn't anticipated. And then surgery, surgery was annoying. And I, I was blessed with a lumpectomy versus a full mastectomy. So the poor women and sometimes men who have a full mastectomy, that means they remove the entire breast, one or both. If they choose to reconstruct, that's not just one surgery. They're having multiple surgeries. And so I really dodged a bullet with that one. There was no benefit for me having the full mastectomy. But yeah, 15 months of yikes. And uh, I'm glad it's in my rear view mirror. That's for sure. So most people don't understand it. I've actually been in the industry. Well, I don't know about the industry, but I've been around cancer kids and yeah. um, and adults and stuff a, a good amount of time. I'm, luckily, I never had it. My mom is a, is a breast cancer survivor. My father is a Merkel cell uh, cancer survivor. So I've been around it. But but ki- people, chemo is poison. It literally is poison. It rids you of everything you have so that when they put the medication back in, that you start over. Well, and so yes and no. Some people are on chemo right now and they're living full lives. They've got their oh, hair. Yeah. They can eat the food. They can run the races. I have a friend, Phil Decker, who's run several marathons during his mm-hmm. colon cancer chemo. So cool. But not, but some of us are just in a different boat. And they threw me what my doctor said is he was giving me, in hindsight, after the fact, he said, no, I gave you the nastiest concoction we give anybody. And the four nasty drugs and they, it was God awful. I'm thrilled for people who don't have to have that type of chemo. And really, as long as we survive it, right, we get past it. Right, right. And again, it's the, what you said, absolutely, the nastiest type. And that's what I was trying to just put out there. It is nasty. No, you're right. In the current time, they have found ways that they need that to use chemo and different different treatments in order to localize and find the yeah. specific cells, the specific things. Is but when you went through it, and because it you were three different very the you, 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 breast cancer triathlon, right? Her two progest, progest they had to give you that in order to like wipe your body of everything so they can start again. But it's yeah, it's nasty. And yeah, I wouldn't wish I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, let alone you. So uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was awful. What's interesting is chemo number one is super scary because of the unknown, right? You walk in, you think, what is this? What's going to happen? I had friends who had breast cancer, uh, the triple negative breast cancer. And those were two my two girlfriends who I was looking to for guidance. I created a little wall because once people know, everybody's like, hey, my cousin's best friend had breast cancer. Let me get me hook you up. I'm like, no. I don't want to talk to everybody. I've got doctors. I'm going to take their advice. And then I had two close girlfriends who were go- either recently finished or were going through it at the time. So I, I decided they would be the people I'd talk to. And they had triple negative breast cancer and they had a drug that nickname is the Red Devil. And so I thought, well, clearly that has to be the worst thing. It's called the Red Devil. Now they call it that because it's red. But but both of them had said, no, I'm not really sick. I feel a little mousy, a little tired after chemo. But it's really not that bad. And so I thought, well, whatever I'm getting clearly is going to be way better than that because it's not the red devil. And I was wrong. (laughs) I was wrong. I was wrong. They uh, they went. I don't know. It was like a nuclear explosion went off inside of me and it didn't stop for over a year. But again, I get to live to tell the tale. So cry me a river, right? What doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And you are obviously one of the strongest that I've ever met. So. So you're going through all of this, right? You said 15 months, 33 different radiation treatments. Plus, what's going on inside your head? Because you are such an optimist and you're teaching these people to get through fitness and stuff. What's going on through your head while you're going through all of this? Yeah. So great question. That's very important stuff. It's the most important. So originally I thought, well, surely I'm dying. I thought I have the perfect career, perfect family. I'm somewhat of the perfect example of health and fitness, I'm going to make the perfect tale of tragedy. And it was sad to think that I was going to die. But really what I was gutted about was losing my kids' lives. Ginger was 15 at the time. Parker was 13. And 
I really mourned losing them. So it, it was about a week and a half until I met my oncologist and he said, no, you're not dying. We have a plan to cure you. You just have to endure the cure. So then I thought, okay, now I have choices. So lovely to have choices. And so my number one choice was to utilize perspective, which has always been my right-hand man. But I, there were there's babies in the hospital here at the University of Florida Health. They did nothing. I never had the why me moment. A, babies didn't do anything to cause themselves cancer. So that's a stupid thought at all. Why me? Why not me, right? And then uh, I just kept thinking, well, it would be way harder to be a baby or a child with cancer than to be a grown up with cancer. And I was so for I was so grateful that I wasn't a parent of a kid with cancer. Right. So I think when you start thinking about what really is a worst case situ- scenario, me having breast cancer wasn't the worst case scenario. And so what I decided is that I the stress was real. The stress was unbearable. And this grief and the loss, the losses kept coming for a long time. It, w- it was really difficult. But I would probably cry about 15 minutes every day. I didn't schedule it in. It would just happen. <laughs> when I felt it coming, I would go in my bathroom and shut the door. I'd go in my car and I'd cry. And then I'd, I'd get all the boohoos out and then I'd get on with it because I do have children and dragging them down further after they were already so fearful for me wasn't going to be okay. And yeah, I would just cry and then get on with it. And I hope people know that it's okay to feel sad. It's okay to grieve. It's not okay to to bask in those feelings. It's not okay to wallow. And I'm a bit type A. And so my instincts are, what can I do? What can I control? And, And that matters not only with cancer, but everyday life is control what you can, when you can. And so knowing that I was stressed, what can I do to relieve the stress? So for me, the things that worked or exercise. I couldn't always do that. So I had a duck at the time, spend time with my duck, spend time with my dog, be outside. I would turn on music. I would get in the shower and gosh, there was a lot of crying in the shower, but I would turn, I'd go to YouTube and search for Jerry Seinfeld. That was it. Just search Jerry Seinfeld. And I would listen to him. I'd listen to his stand up. I would listen to his interviews and just force joy upon myself. And so that really mattered. And then the other great decision I made was to continue pursuing my passions, which was probably the coolest decision I've ever made in my entire life. Wow. Oh, so that's fantastic. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run down this list because you gave us some great little things. So first of all, you get into a situation that's not, it doesn't have to be cancer. Right. It could just be an obstacle in your way. It could be some, a little bit of adversity that you need to get through. But basically what you said is utilize perspective. Right. Yeah. And basically you said comparing yourself to people that might have it worse, might even have it better. And w- fine. Where does your perspective lie? And then you said, allow yourself to cry. Allow it to happen, but don't bask in it. Yeah. Give yourself some time, allow yourself to cry and then move on and then determine what you can control. The serenity prayer. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Allow me the strength to allow me the strength to control what I can and the wisdom to know the difference between yeah, yeah. what I can and what I can't. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have them off the top of my head, but great thing. And then force joy and then continue pursuing your passions. Yeah. Am I missing something? No, you nailed it. That was it. That was it. That's my big, my words of wisdom right there, Brad. <laughs> All right. I love that. So the interesting thing is that, so we were, we, t- we went back and you said that you had, done a 5k with someone that had breast cancer and unfortunately maybe i made an ass out of myself but i assume that was after your no. cancer no that was it's before. 20 something years ago when i was doing personal training that's been a long time but yeah it was many years ago and it's interesting i think i was probably about 22 when i showed up at a, a fitness conference and i took a course on how to train women who had been through breast cancer care. And I learned so much about it. And you're managing the potential for lymphedema. You're trying to avoid irritating the arm that has had lymph nodes removed and so forth. So I learned a lot about it back then. But then it was a friend and neighbor who she was diagnosed and she came to me and said, hey, my dad wants to hire me a personal trainer. Are you available? And at that point, I had already been done personal training. But I said, yeah, for you, for sure. And it was great. And I've done all sorts of walks and the fundraising and all the stuff. And it's one thing to support a cause. It's another thing to show up 
and be the cause. And so when I was going through treatment, I never stopped working. I traveled all around the country. I boarded over 30 planes out of Gainesville, Florida to go announce races and do keynotes. And right here in my own backyard, we had that Making Strides for Breast Cancer walk. And so they invited me to do like a keynote before the walk. And I show up there and I was like, well, damn it. I'm the cause. (laughs) I am the cause. And I was, my hair had just started coming back. I was a skinny as a little rail and all of these little things. I was like, oh, it's me this time. And it's very humbling. It's So this is interesting. As soon as I got diagnosed, I started ribbons, pink ribbons made me recoil, just really bothered me. I'd see those pink ribbons and I, and everyone was buying me stuff. They're like, oh, it's almost like, congratulations, you got breast cancer. Here's a hat with a ribbon. <laughs> Here's a shirt with a ribbon. And so all well-intentioned. But in my mind, I was like, no, and not putting on that ribbon. And so I was really averse. And I still am. I really understand it at first. It took a while, but that ribbon makes me feel like a victim. And so I know that the pink ribbon stands for this cause and the cure. And it, breast cancer is extraordinary because it was killing droves of women for a very long time. And some men, I, I never want to leave them out. But people just got really sick of it. They got pissed off. They didn't want to lose any more mothers and sisters and wives and daughters and yeah. grandmas and so forth. And so the fundraising has been highly effective because they put those dollars to good use. And now 94% of people diagnosed with breast cancer are cured, which is amazing. And I'm so grateful for that. But that ribbon will never define me. This disease will not define me. And I do not wear the pink ribbon like I'm part of the team. I have that Florida Gator logo. I wear a lot. I wear the Big Sur Marathon logo with great pride. You put that pink ribbon near me and I just, I don't want anything to do with it. And again, it's it's wonderful. I support the causes, but yeah, it's just interesting what it does to you. And I think it was me. It was my cancer. I get to make the choice. I still, I wear pink. Pink's pretty. And I will raise tons of funds and I will volunteer and support those causes. And I do. But yeah, it's just, you know, can- cancer hits people in different ways. And I'm not a victim at all. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. As soon as you mentioned it, as soon as you said you were adverse, I was like, she didn't want to be a victim. No. Nope. Knew it right away. Nope. It just seems to be that the the outlook on, on life right now is uh, tends to lean us in that side. And I can see you being who you are. I'm like, okay, she didn't want to be a victim. I knew it as soon as you said it. So kudos to that, because I I think you're right. It's an awareness. It's not, and that's what it's supposed to be about, making you aware of the cause. But if you are the cause, it will, it it flips on you. So I I get that. So as I traveled this country with the bald head, I never wore a wig. It was probably a little more powerful than any ribbon. And I've got the scars to show it. If you want to see breast cancer, I could show you breast cancer, but no ribbons for me. Thank you very much. I get it. I get it. So, all right. So what was your first marathon? Let's get into some, let's get some positivity here. Let's go. Well, let's run get on it. My first marathon so far has still been my only marathon and it is none other than the Boston marathon. What? Uh, how did you do that? Yeah. You yeah. Have to qualify for Boston. <laughs> well, so I at least two. That's one way. That's one way to run the Boston Marathon. So I had Meb Kofleski, the 2014 Boston Marathon champ, American running icon on the fitness show. That's my podcast. And so it was a live interview. And I'm trying to think. Yeah, it was like June of 2021. And so I end the conversation with Meb, which was awesome. If you haven't listened to that interview, it's spectacular. His coming to America story is just mind blowing. The whole thing is so great. So anyways, I get off with Meb and then I get a phone call from this guy, Vince Varallo. Vince has a large running group called the Boston Buddies. And so he calls, he goes, hey, I just want to let you know that was an awesome interview. And I said, oh, thank you so much. And if, I, I thought that's why I was calling or I would have maybe right. not answered the phone. He's like, so anyways, we work with Boston. We work with a charity and they handpicked you to run the Boston Marathon this year. Would you run the Boston Marathon for the second step. It's this domestic violence uh, support cause for Boston. I was like, well, I cursed him out. First of all, I gave him all sorts of ugly curse words. And he was like, no, you could do it. And mind you, I was still working my way back up. I had lost so much weight. I got to the point where my mom had said, like, you need to eat. You look like you're in the Holocaust. I said, I know I'm trying here. And I had wasted away. So I was rebuilding myself back up and doing a pretty good job. And so I get this invitation. So after I curse 
Vince out. I say, when do you need to know by? He goes, the end of the week. And I said, I'll let you know tomorrow. And so I just, and I, and when I said that, I knew I was going to do it, but I just mulled it over. I texted Dave McGilvery, the former race director there. And I said, I just got invited. What should I do? He said, why would you not? I said, you're right. And then I was thinking about it. And I just thought, well, I think I've just done the ser- scariest thing you could do. Aside from harm coming to my children, nothing in my life is ever going to be scary again compared to all that, right? And so I thought, well, Boston Marathon, that's got to be child's play, right? So game on, let's do it. And I did. I trained. It was the October 21 Boston Marathon. And it was so fun. And my training was effective. I did not run it fast. I never run fast. I've never been a fast runner, but I'm a finisher, right? And it was a great day. I had a lot of fun. Well, in fact, we probably had too much fun for it to be the Boston Marathon. And I was super proud of myself. And I still wear the little bracelet they put on uh, us. So that was the weird COVID year, the first re- race post-COVID. And they made everyone yeah. get a stupid little band-aid or a bracelet to prove that they didn't have COVID. And so I just left mine on. I thought, you know what? All the races that I announced are for everybody else. This one was for me. So three years later, I still have that dumb little bracelet on my arm, but what else? It was an awesome oh. experience. Well, yeah. And then because then the April, because then they got back on track, right? So April yep. 22nd, it was boring. It was rainy and doesn't it, it was nasty. I so you know where it, I think that was 20. 20- 18 was the crazy storm in Boston. I think in April, it was still good weather that year. I think you're just, yeah. Well, or, well, no, there was just a recent one. So maybe it was 23 then. Maybe, maybe 23 was where we're well, I had beautiful yeah. weather. You had beautiful weather. Yeah. I thought the very next, I think that very next April, they had like, it was crap. But maybe, maybe, it, was. maybe it was 2023. Yeah. Cause it was, it, there was, but yeah, 2018 was a torrential downpour. That's when yeah. Des Linden yep. ended up winning and the guy from Japan. Yeah, that's when he won that one as well. Hardcore. Yeah, I'm a big Des fan. But just to give you my little story about Meb, I Meb lives out here in Tampa. Yep. So I see him all the time. I go to, I I have a group that I coach on Tuesdays at a middle school out here. And his daughter runs with one of my, one of my ex-coaches, Drawer Vankin. Okay. And so he's out there. And then okay. he's got a, he's got a race every year called Run With Meb. Yeah. And then he's a good friend of a of a running group that I coach that I coach for called Run Tampa. So he's always there too. So all of one of the races that we do, he'll show up, be entertained. We'll be able to talk to him. And you're right. The most down to earth, yeah. grateful, humble person that you've ever met. You never believe it. So I've worked with Meb quite a few times, Philadelphia Marathon and Gasparilla a bunch. He's our special guy at Gasparilla, right? Yeah. And so it's so funny because we pair up, we do book signings together at the expo. I bring my books, he brings his, yeah. and blah, blah, blah. But he's always like, thank you so much for partnering me. You bring such a long line. I'm like, no, that's a, that's yeah, a those people are here for you. Maybe it's good for me. He's like, no, he's just humble to the nth yeah. degree. He is such a lovely, decent man. Next time you see him, you run up and you tackle him with all your might. You give him this big old bear hug. And then when he, Right before he slugs you, you say, no, that was from six. Well, I don't know. Okay. Don't know. You got it. You got it. I will do that because his, his daughter is a heck of a runner. She mm-hmm. definitely got the genes. And I've, so he was, we're at the tinsel run and he was, had a long line of people taking yeah. pictures, signing stuff. And I'm talking to his daughter and I'm like, yeah, so is this something that happens all the time? She goes, you'd be surprised. Not really. She goes, I'm like, he doesn't, so you're not in the grocery store. She goes, once in a great while, someone will mention it. But most of the time, it's only when he's in the community. But so, go ahead. I was just going to say, so that's our sport, is we do not have household names. We don't have any athletes that my mother has ever heard of, or probably your mother has ever heard of. Of course, she knows who Tom Brady is and A-Rod. And the running sport is we don't have household names. But we do have people that are special for us. And that's probably good for their quality of life, right? He gets to go to the grocery store without being harassed. And then when he shows up at a race, he knows he's going to get lots of extra love. Yeah. I Yeah. For me, it was always um, Rinda Carfrey and, and Tim O'Donnell. And every time I got to see them, they've been out here a few times doing triathlons. They've And I've gone and done triathlons that they've been at. And I was a volunteer when Marinda was running. And that always was a big thing. And but yet. Yeah. When I talk to them, like I've talked to Tim on the phone and he's like, yeah, it's not, it doesn't happen. Like I'm Tom Cruise. I've never heard of him. 
Oh, yeah. So those are two Iron Man world champions. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. And you're even in the, and you're even I'm in the business. Current, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And they're definitely running versus, versus triathlon. You're going to yeah. have the same thing. But I get, you know what? That's a great, I would say that would be probably a good thing for grat- gratification for them is the fact that you're right. They can go to the grocery store, to the library. Absolutely. They can go buy, I go buy a newspaper and they're not going to get tackled. Yeah. At least not the way that you do. <laughs> but <laughs> so what got you into race announcing? So I was, for lack of a better word, I was the fitness expert for Run Disney. I would show up and teach clinics at their events. So strength training for runners, pain prevention and management for runners, blah, blah, blah. And I would speak a couple of times per weekend. I did that for a couple of years. And their race announcer, well, they they have a stable, but their premier race announcer, the big voice, the one everybody loved was Rudy Novotny. And Rudy, he, he and I became friendly, just how you doing kind of friends. And then he was stuck introducing me at the expo. He would work the expos and that's when they had the speaker series. So he was always stuck saying, and our next speaker is Fitz Kohler, blah, blah, blah. And so he would sit there through my presentations and he, when I'd get done, he was just so complimentary. And eventually he said, you know what? I I need a co-announcer for the OC, the Orange County Marathon in California in a few months. Are you interested? And I said, well, I've never done it before, but I see what you do. It looks like a lot of fun. It looks like it'd be within my wheelhouse. So if you show me the ropes, I'd love to give it a try. And so he connected me with the race director, Gary Kutcher. And I'm so grateful to the two of them because he really have handed me this career on a silver platter. And so Gary and I chit-chatted. He went to fitness.com. He looked around and he said, you know what? Come and give it a try. Let's see how it works. And so Went to the OC. We had a big day Saturday with about 5,000 kids running the kids' races. And I love that. And then on marathon morning, about an hour after I yelled go for the first time, he came over to me at the finish line and said, would you please come back next year? And I said, for sure. And that just steamrolled into other race directors saying, well, can you do my race? And it's interesting. So Rudy, has he's he really is my favorite race announcer. He's so far leaps and pounds above everybody else, the charisma and the voice and the, the connection with the running community is just insane. But he mostly does a lot of California. California is so busy. Really, they've got a, such a busy running state. And I have, I, most of my races are all over the place. I definitely do a bunch in California. Big Sur, Los Angeles was mine for a long time. Oh, yada, yada, but Buffalo, Fargo. Gasparilla, the Donna, Rocket City. And so I tend to bounce around the country uh, more. And I, I'm sure I've announced well, a few hundred races over the past 10 years. And I would like very much to announce a race in every state. And I think I'm over 20 something states for sure, probably at about 25. So, but and none of that's important because what it means to me is my ability to connect with tens and thousands of wonderful people. And with my career in fitness, I'm constantly arm twisting, trying to convince people that exercise is a good idea. And right. And then on race day, some race organizations say, Fitz, here's 25,000 people who thinks exercise is fun. Can you make sure they know what to do, where to go and have a great time? And I say, hell yeah. And so I'm there for structure and entertainment and engagement on race day. But really, my mission is just to love everybody and make sure they feel totally welcome and highly rewarded. And when they cross that finish line, they feel like they won it. Every last one of them down to the last finisher and says, I want them to come back and, and race again, whether they race with me or race somewhere else. I just want all of those people to have a wonderful experience so they continue to put one foot in front of another that will change the way they live for sure. Absolutely. So when you said run Disney, was that here at Walt Disney yeah, World? Yeah, Florida. Yeah. And I did some work over at Disneyland. I'm trying to think if that was for corporate. I can't remember if I did race stuff at Disneyland, but I definitely hear a bunch in Florida. Are you, and you did, you were here for a marathon weekend? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, right. well, I just want to know because I, so I've done the dopey five times and the goofy seven times. So I, yeah, that's like one of my favorite races. And when I talked to my in September, I usually get a like I get a plethora of people that get onto my roster on September in September because they want to run okay the Disney Marathon yeah yeah right? so September rolls around and all of a sudden I got emails after emails and like hey can you get nice. me to my first marathon and blah 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 so yeah so I end up being out there plus I was a 
I was a coach for a while for the Lymphoma Leukemia Society. So I coached there as well as run it. And yeah, I love run Disney. And I always tell people, I'm like, you don't do Disney to PR. <laughs> I tell yeah. them all that all the time. Yeah. Matter of fact, when I tell them, and I says, you know what my PR is when I do Disney races? How many pictures can I get? And I hope yeah. I get one more than last year. That's right. Yeah. It's a very different experience and weird and fun and fabulous. I haven't really done anything with Run Disney, I think since about 2016 or 2017. It's been a long time. They they just started shutting down a lot of the offerings. There was a heyday of Run Disney where they everything was firing on all cylinders and everybody felt like a VIP. And then they started cutting back and they cut back on the speaker series and they cut back on a lot of other things. So people still love it, though. People still love it. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. So the races used to op be open for a month. Like you could sign up for about a month. Right. And they cut down so many slots that you're within an hour, it's sold out. Yeah. And it's very tough to get into unless you know somebody or you just happen to have three phones sitting in front of you at the moment that they open it up, which is sad because it used to be such a, it would, like you said, they treated everybody like a VIP. It was yeah. wonderful. But you know what? Hopefully they're in the working their way back and hopefully that'll pop back in. But oh my God, this has just been amazing. What's your next engagement? What's your next ra race that you're announcing? So I have a wonderfully quiet summer, which I'm quite grateful for because it's been chaos. But I, I go to Canton, Ohio in mid-July for the USATF Women's 6K Championship. And I've been announcing that for I think it's four years and it's awesome. They We bring in some of the fastest women in America. Kira D'Amato's run it. Molly Seidel was there last year. We've had a bunch of heavy hitters. Fiona, who won the Olympic trials, I believe she's one of ours. And yeah, so we have this big group of elites that come in. They win money and they win titles and points for their USATF efforts. And then we have a pack of real everyday women and girls. It's a women's only event and that'll be a lot of fun. And before I do that, I will go to the Columbus Zoo. So this is a little Fitzkohler fun fact is I'm obsessed with animals and I travel alone a lot. And so a really nice thing to do when you travel alone and you like being outside and you like being active is roaming around zoos. So I probably have been to a zoo in almost 25 states too now. So I'm trying to make my way around the country. And, and I think the gold standard for a zoo is if they have a grizzly bear, a polar bear, or a cassowary. And those are the three big ones for me. And then everything else can fall where they may. So I'm going to go to Columbus Zoo this year. I was at Cleveland last year, this year's Columbus. And I'm really stoked about that. And I'm, uh, a, nerd. <laughs> I'm a total nerd. I, I, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. I have seven cats. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. And the only reason, and they would be dogs if I didn't train so much and I wasn't away from home and coaching and everything. Otherwise they'd be dogs. I just feel like dogs, you need to be around them all the time. They need to have their people. Cats are okay with you being around just a few hours a day. They do their own That's thing. really care, do they? They're like, mm, get out of here, Brad. <laughs> You've got the for now. <laughs> you'd, you'd be shocked. They, they definitely are happy when you're around. They are happier when you're around. But uh, it's my problem is I adopt. It's like someone goes around like, oh, my God, I found this stray cat. I'm like, well, if you can't find a family for me, let me know. Maybe I can find one for them. I pick them up. I look at it. I fall in love and they end up at my house. Brad, thank you for doing that. More people should rescue than breed. That's awesome. Thank you. Oh, yeah. No, every single one of mine is is a rescue. I actually flew down to Miami to pick up a rescue and I brought them back. I brought them back. So anyway, that's me. That's not okay. here nor there. But but yeah. So have you been to have you been to Brookfield Zoo? No, I don't even know where that is. Where is that? It's right outside of Chicago. I did go to a zoo in Chicago. No, I think I is it Lincoln? Zoo. Lincoln Park Zoo. Yeah, that one I went to. Was as I get that Lincoln Park's night. It's short. It's small. It's kind of like Central Park Zoo, which you probably yeah. haven't been to. I imagine. Yeah, but it was. I've not been to Central Park Zoo. No. Oh, okay. That one you need to go to. That one's an interesting one. Okay. But yeah, so all these. Uh, so, but you've been into all these other cool zoos. What's the other zoo that I've been to? The Phoenix Zoo. Okay, haven't done that. So my favorite is St. Louis. Believe it or okay. not, St. Louis is, has a wonderful zoo and the whole area there is just green and it's free. It's a free zoo and they do have a grizzly bear and I believe they have a polar bear and it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, I'm there with you. I'm a huge animal lover and I cringe 
at when I see any kind of flagrant yeah abuse is yeah it, it goes crazy it goes right to my heart it's awful but anyway well listen let's let's wrap this up I am so I am still so f- humbled and that I get to, that I get to meet you in person I am just over the moon joyed and humbled that you're able to come on life changing challengers and so for the rest of you uh, in the show notes you'll have a link right to fitness dot com. You're going to get to, you'll have a link to all of her books. You'll have a link to her podcast. Mm-hmm. So, so please follow and share this episode and for the Fitness podcast and the books and yeah. And visit Fitz out there in cyber, in the cyber world. We'll also have her, we'll all have, have her socials posted on the show notes as well. So take a look at that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd love to ask everybody, if you are going to follow, please reach out and say hi and let me know. You heard me on Brad's podcast because the best part about what I do is actually connecting with people. So I do promise quality content for the follow, but I'd much rather have friends than followers. And then of course, if we could see each other on race day, get a little race day love and that would be super nice. So yeah, don't be shy. Nobody should be shy around me. So, all right. So before you go, are you already are you already scheduled for Gasparilla 2020? Yes, I will definitely. All right, Gasparilla. I am going to see you at Gasparilla. I'm going to make sure of it. Excellent. So, excellent. So again, so check out the show notes for all that information. If you've seen the, if you've seen the episode, go ahead and share, like, and drop a little review if you'd like. I would appreciate it. Other than that, we will see you in the next one. Well, that wraps up another episode of Life Changing Challengers. I'm your host, Brad Minus, saying thank you for joining us on this journey of transformation. If today's stories inspired you, please take a moment to review, share, and follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Your support helps us reach more listeners and creating an even bigger impact. Remember, every challenge is a chance to grow. Until next time, keep pushing, keep challenging, and never stop pursuing your extraordinary.